Okay, well, let's get started. Welcome, everybody. Um, before I, I turn this over uh, to our guest uh, speaker today, I kind of wanted to just chat about one thing that came up last class that I thought um, kind of hits on something that's in the news right now, so it would be kind of fun to, to, to think about. A large portion of the first chunk of this course, either from dimensional analysis, which we've covered, or for what's coming next, which is the process to non-dimensionalize equations, leads to this formation of uh, dimensionless groups, dimensionless products. And we've kind of talked about how these dimensionless groups or products represent a ratio of kind of one either physical or geometric uh, quantity to another. Um, but I think it's kind of, it's hard for me to overstate how powerful and important these dimensionless groups can be. And I had a feeling last class when we were talking about droplet splashing that there was like a little bit of like, oh, and then Professor Holmes made me rewrite this in terms of the Weber number, whatever that is. Um, and I kind of wanted to just draw your attention to something really quickly, um, which is the appearance of the Weber number in a recent um, pretty big science, uh, scientific story which is all of you probably have heard about the finding of phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus, which has been hypothesized as well. It's either due to some physical or chemical process that we are unfamiliar of, uh, we don't understand where it could come from, or it could be due to life. And I wanted to draw your attention to a couple of points. This is the abstract, this is the actual paper. Uh, I cut out some excerpts from it. This is the abstract uh, for this paper. Um, and I highlighted in yellow, they talk about kind of the droplet being the habitat for these life forms to exist. And one of the things they write is the droplets can't fragment or droplet fragmentation, which would reduce the particle size, does not occur in the Venusian atmospheric conditions. So that's kind of a bold statement. Like, did, all right, one reason, one way that we could disprove that this is the that our hypothesis is, is correct would be to say that these droplets could fragment and just fall down to the Venus's surface. And here we are on the right hand side. How do we know that? Well, we look at the Weber number. And the Weber number, again, as we talked about last class, is a ratio of these disruptive hydrodynamic forces to the stabilizing surface tension forces. And if that Weber number is less than 12, we would not expect fragmentation to occur. And based on calculations, from the uh, atmospheric values in Venus's um, kind of habitable cloud layer, they basically say, look, the resulting Weber number is much, much less than one. Our dimensionless ratio of these two quantities is so small that we can rule out this in forming our hypothesis for why we think life could be forming in these droplets, or at least whatever is producing phosphine perhaps is forming in these droplets. So I just wanted to draw your attention to these ideas that we're talking about in terms of something as seemingly childish as like a drop splashing, the physics behind that uh, can be broadly applied to a wide array of problems. And in this case, we're talking about possibly one of the greatest unknown questions uh, in science, which is, you know, is there life outside of, uh, outside of Earth? So I wanted to bring this up to just kind of reinforce why we're thinking about these ratios, how just knowing whether or not a ratio is small or large can confirm or deny a portion of a hypothesis. And, and in this case, a very significant hypothesis. So with that, I want to stop sharing my screen and introduce our speaker, uh, Alex. Let me see if I can pin your video. There you are. Da, 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 da. All right. I do that. Spotlight video? Yeah. Oh, wait. Why did that happen? Ah. All right, cool. Um, yeah. Can you give me the, the Zoom meeting with number? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. The Zoom ID is, uh, well, you should be able to see it on the screen here. So it's up top. So if this is just for the students in class trying to join on Zoom. And the password is, uh, well, actually, I will write the password. 
sponsor over here. All right. So once you're joined, then I will uh, turn this over uh, to Alex. Alex uh, is a PhD student here in mechanical engineering at uh, Boston University. He works in Professor Bird's lab. Um, he's also going to be talking to us about things that relate to bubbles and droplets. Um, uh, I had the pleasure of teaching Alex uh, this exact course a couple of years ago uh, when we were piloting. Uh, this applied math class. And so to me, it's, uh, I think it's a, a great way for you as students to see that these ideas can be applied directly to your research now. Um, you know, I, I want this course to be useful to you uh, today. And so um, I'm excited because Alex's paper is really, really cool and, and, and interesting. And I kind of want to see um, him talk through it, both in terms of the science and also in terms of the actual applied mathematical techniques. And so, Alex, without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to you for, for teaching us. Well, thank you for the introduction and uh, for inviting me to give this presentation here. It's a real pleasure. pleasure. Uh, so I guess I'll, I'll start sharing my screen. Uh, let's see. Hopefully you can see my screen. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Okay, so uh, this is a, a paper. Um, the title I have here, maybe I should have changed it based on the paper, but uh, the idea here is uh, looking at the buckling instability, especially the, in particular the wrinkling instability of these viscous bubbles. Uh, this is a project that was started by my advisor, uh, Professor James Bird, here at uh, Boston University. He started this over 10 years ago um, when he was still a PhD student uh, under the supervision of Howard Stone at Harvard. And then he went on to MIT for his postdoc to study this with uh, John Bush as well. But um, there were a couple of things, I guess, they uh, they, they they were stuck upon, and uh, you know, a couple of things happening between in terms of moving uh, from uh, MIT to BU. So uh, he gave this project to me about uh, a year and a half ago, and uh, we were very happy to kind of um, publish this after so, such a long time. So I'm just going to go through it. And just to give you uh, an overview of what I'll be talking, it's just a presentation of the paper. So I'll, if, you, if you have the chance to read it, uh, I'll just be going through essentially what, what, what we're writing there in terms of the, um, uh, the process, the, 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 the structure. But I've added a couple of uh, mathematical uh, um, techniques that were used in the class and how you could uh, apply them to, to the, the problem that we were studying as well. So I'll just start. Can I just jump in really quickly to say, please, uh, if you don't mind, Alex, please interrupt and and ask questions. This is this should be, um, yeah, I, I want this to be part part of the the, the discussion to be a good part of, of what we're doing here. So feel free to shout out a question. Of course, absolutely. All right, so I'll first start with uh, elastic wrinkling. Um, there was a paper published in 2003 by Serda and Mahadevan. And what they did is they clamped a very thin uh, elastic sheet that was fairly soft and they were uh, stretching it uniaxially. And what they observed was this uh, uh, symmetrical, this, this beautiful wrinkling pattern uh, in the middle. And um, this particular paper, I think uh, Doug himself was the one who told me that kind of inspired uh, a lot of uh, a new area of research, in particular on elastic wrinkling. And over the last um, 15 to 20 years, there have been multiple studies looking at this. So for instance, what happened when you take a very uh, thin sheet and uh, you uh, put it on a, a bath of water, you let it float on the top and then you add a, uh, a drop on top of it. So this is the picture that you see in the middle. You see that based on the um, thickness of the sheet, you see this uh, symmetrical and beautiful wrinkling patterns that occur and change uh, their, um, their morphology depending on the properties of the system. Another beautiful and favorite of mine is when you have a, a beach ball that you you know you take to the beach on a sunny day, but if you poke it uh, due to the pressure inside, this is on the top right, you see again this wrinkling pattern uh, forming. And then something that's also, I think, closer related to us in terms of the structure uh, and also the physics behind it is when you have a, um, 
a, um, a curved uh, water interface and you drop a, an ultra thin sheet, this is again nanometrically thin, hundreds of nanometers, and uh, you, 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 you uh, place it on top of this curved interface, uh, you see that due to the surface tension stretching it at the edges, you again observe a wrinkling pattern. So, uh, lots of studies have tried to understand here the uh, exact mecha uh, proposed mechanistic models in terms of how stress distributions contribute essentially to how many wrinkles are forming on the sheet and where exactly are they located uh, along the sheet. So this is for the last wrinkling, but um, viscous liquids, they can also buckle if they're sufficiently viscous. Uh, G.I. Taylor in the late 60s uh, performed a, a beautiful experiment by taking a, mer a, a very viscous uh, oil and floating it on top of mercury and he was able to observe buckling patterns that were very reminiscent of how solids uh, were buckling. Um, a, a study um, about eight years ago uh, was able to formulate this and provide kind of the uh, criteria necessary for a viscous uh, thread to buckle. So if you compress it fast enough, you see that it uh, uh, buckles much like a piece of spaghetti would if you were to compress it uh, uh, statically at the end. Uh, another one that we may be more familiar with is when you drop, uh, when a, a very viscous fluid is dripping, such as honey or maple syrup. So it kind of starts to coil and uh, a lot of research has been done on that, on kind of the folding patterns that you can uh, obtain based on how far you're pulling it away, how thick it is, how viscous it is. But the one that uh, mostly relates to, to what we did is this uh, instability that occurs when a uh, collapsing, this wrinkling instability that occurs when a viscous bubble is ruptured at the top and starts to collapse. This was first shown by De Bragas, De Gen, and the Brochard Riac group from uh, 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 from France in Paris in 1998. And uh, I just wanted to, to bring up just a couple of uh, applications where viscous buckling might be important. So here on the left, you can see uh, thin sheets of glass. So uh, when they typically uh, manufacture these um, very thin glass sheets, they heat them up. So glass becomes a, a viscous liquid and they, they stretch them. And during this uh, extrusion process to obtain the glass of the desired geometry, they obtain these wrinkles that are typically undesired because they, they affect the flatness of the sheet. So a lot of models have been done to kind of um, understand when and why this buckling, uh, this wrinkling deformation occurs. But we, when we think of viscous liquid, then we go to very extreme cases such as uh, magma or lava. Uh, also, uh, we think about bubbles and when they rise uh, to the surface, what kind of gases they release during a um, volcanic explosion. So these are a couple of applications. But going back to what we want to study here is this viscous bubble. So what you see here is a, um, a bubble on top of a very, very viscous silicon oil. So we have injected air inside this bath of the uh, oil. The air will slowly, slowly rise. This is extremely viscous. Uh, just to put it into context, uh, water has um, a uh, viscosity of about uh, 0 0.001 pascal seconds. So if you think about uh, honey, honey is about 10,000 times more viscous than water. This particular silicon oil is a million times, so it's, it's extremely viscous. It's so viscous that if you were to turn this upside down, it would take minutes for the uh, uh, oil to start flowing down. But if we look at this, we see that the bubble has risen to the surface. Um, its radius is about one centimeter. And because it's uh, large enough compared to uh, what's referred to the capillary length, uh, so the ratio between the gravitational and the uh, capillary forces, it really rises beyond the surface and forms this almost perfect hemisphere. So I'm going to play this video. And what you will see here is that as we um, allow it to, as we rupture it at the top, the bubble collapses flat down. And uh, as it does so, you see this uh, wrinkling instability that, uh, this wrinkling pattern that uh, develops at the edges. And what's really interesting here to note is that it really just drops down. And um, why this is important is because um, based on this collapse and the fact that it was just moving downwards, um, Certain models, uh, so apart from the, the, the group in Paris that I mentioned in 1998, two years later, um, 
there was another uh, model that tried to study the wrinkling instability, and they said that the collapse and the wrinkling itself was driven by gravity, so gravity was dropping it straight down. And because it's so viscous, the resisting force in this case was viscosity that gave rise to a number, uh, to a, a formula or a scaling relation that for the number of wrinkles that you can estimate based on essentially the balance of those two forces, gravitational forces and viscous forces. I'm sorry, Alex. Yep. Is it like echoing? Yeah, uh, you can go ahead right now. I'll mute this right now. So when the... Uh, Maybe I can move mine. Okay. Can you hear me, Alex? Yep. Okay. So when the radius of the bubble R is smaller than capillary N, what does how does the bubble look different from this? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the, uh, in case anybody didn't hear, is what, what would happen to the bubble shape if it was uh, smaller than the capillary length? So if we go, um, I'll, I'll leave this picture, I guess, here. Uh, what you can see here is that the capillary length is essentially a length above which um, any drop or bubble, uh, if its radius, if its size is larger than the capillary length, that means that its shape is essentially uh, determined by gravitational forces. Uh, if it's smaller than the capillary length, it, it, its shape is mostly determined by um, uh, capillary forces rather than gravitational forces. Gravitational forces would be forced, excuse me. So if the bubble was much smaller than the capillary length, it would remain spherical, but it would never extend beyond the surface. As its length becomes more and more comparable to the capillary length, that means it starts to rise up above and above and closer and closer and closer to the surface. So it starts to distort the, the, uh, the interface. And when it's much, much larger than it, it really extends beyond it, forms almost a perfect hemisphere with a tiny, tiny amount uh, be, below the surface. Mm -hmm. I, so, I don't have the schematic, but uh, if you want to get, yeah, exactly, okay. something like that. Yeah. Is it, and there's another dimensionless name that characterizes that uh, ratio, correct? Is it the bond number? That is correct. So I was uh, referring to the ratio of the um, radius compared to the capillary length. Now, if you were to combine that ratio, it's referred to as the bond number, which exactly compares those two forces, gravity and the uh, surface tension. Okay, so uh, I'll continue. Um, what we have here, therefore, is this bubble. Now, because uh, the bubble um, itself is spherical, it has a, a curved interface, there is an extra pressure inside it uh, it's referred to as the Laplace pressure, so I'm uh, referring to here as delta P. Uh, and as it rises up to the surface, it drives a lot of liquid along with it that's remaining at the bubble walls. But because of gravity, um, this uh, liquid on the walls, it starts to drain. So gravity tries to uh, essentially cause the bubble to become thinner and thinner. And as it does so, there is this variation in thickness. So at the top, the bubble is the thinnest. Whether, whereas at the side, it's the, th the thickest. Now, if we introduce a hole at the top, that excess pressure is going to escape. Uh, the air is going to leave through the hole. And therefore, we have an uh, equilibrium between the pressure difference inside and outside. And then if we look at the bubble film itself, the, the, the walls of the bubble, and we look at the forces acting on it, we do have gravity here, referred to here as a gravitational force, Fg equal to, um, rho g8 times the area of the little element that we're considering here. But because the walls themselves are curved, we also have surface tension driving the film inward. So the previous models, they established that gravity was the one that's driving it downwards. But if you consider any other um, uh, bubble uh, rupture or collapse, it's actually surface tension. So why is gravity more important in viscous cases than surface tension? So we wanted to ask this question. And if we were to do a simple scaling argument here, we can see these forces. So we have the capillary force being as this excess pressure gamma over R times dA, whereas gravity is equal to rho GH times dA. And if we consider characteristic values here for each one of them, so the surface tension of, um, of this oil is about 0 0.02, so about 10 to the negative two kilogram per second squared or Newton per meter. I just did it here in terms of uh, units to make the you want to follow to make it easier to, to, to cancel them out. So the density is about uh, 900 and 990, so close to 1,000 kilograms per meter cube. Gravity, let's take it at 10. 
Now, a typical thickness is about uh, 10 microns, and then the radius, as we said before, is about one centimeter. So if we were to compare these two forces, uh, we see that the gravitational force is smaller than the capillary force by factor of 10. So capillary forces exceed uh, the gravitational forces uh, by a factor of 10. So why is gravity driving this and not surface tension? Uh, so uh, we... I got a question out here. I read your paper and it seems you have factor of 4 in your paper yes. for FB, which is your F gamma here. So I wonder where um, the ratio between like take the 4 O or taking it in. Because if you accidentally have 1 over 4, the ratio becomes like comparable. Yeah, actually the, the 4 would be uh, 4 times gamma. Mm -hmm. So what would happen is technically because it's spherical and it has two interfaces, so it's both from inside and outside. Technically, that capillary force would be 4 gamma divided by R times the A. So you get a factor of 4, so it becomes closer to um, 40. Uh, and I think we might have had 80 there if you actually put the actual numbers. Um, I just wanted to show here just from a, if you were to do this very simply without any numerical coefficients, what would it, what would it be like? Now, if you were to include them, uh, you'd actually find that this ratio is much larger than and it's closer to, to 80. I just thought, um, that just having the, the values here might be uh, easier to, to um, just do this, this balance from a scaling perspective. So, so the, what they re refer to as scaling is we're neglect I'm neglecting any uh, numerical coefficients and just including the variables here that are uh, important. So I'm curious uh, to write this, this B. So does the FC and the gamma, the equation include the gamma? should be in the same order of scale. So the reason why you can drop off four was four was uh, smaller than 10 or larger than one, is that true? Exactly, it's not a, 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 a very, very large numerical uh, big factor. Right? Uh, if it was 10 or 100, then you, you absolutely should include it, right? But it's, yeah, it's, uh, I, I've never learned when you should drop them or not, to be honest. I think uh, it's it's still uh, it, 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 I think it depends on the particular value itself. Like if, if it's closer to one, of course you should include it. As it gets much smaller, or much larger, then of course you should um, uh, you should start considering the numerical coefficients as well. Uh, but yeah, maybe, maybe I should, should have included it and made it as a, a paper just to. Uh, I think ge like to speak generally, if you have the right scaling for your forces or your energies then the prefactor should be of order one. Mm. So that's one step thing. And two, if you happen to know exactly what the prefactor is for one of the cases, but you don't know for the other. So you know this one is four, which is of near near close to one, but you don't know what it is for pretend for, for the other force. The typical like uh, accepted approach is to is to neglect it for everything. Mm. So you don't want to like include it for one and neglect it for the other. If you know it for everything, you can you can include that Generally, in terms of why we're using this kind of tilde symbol, it's saying the, this is the force. It's it, it will scale as these two factors with a numerical factor that is right around one. Uh, so these symbol is like safe barrier for researchers. Yeah, so this is not this is exactly is, but it's in the same way. exactly. And the way I think of it is, is like these are the parameters in the problem that that dictate the uh, outcome that we're interested in. In this case, calculating maybe the force due to surface tension. We want to know what happens if we double or quadruple the parameters of the problem. And then if you do that, the prefactor is going to stay the same. So we kind of don't really care because it, exactly the question is more of what happens if I cut the thickness in half with double the surface tension as opposed to, you know, and so I think that is where some of this confusion lies as, as students who are used to kind of keeping everything in there. When you're looking for physical insight, which is exactly what Alex is showing here, which is basically saying, that if you want to ask the very simple question of does gravity or surface tension matter more, you compare them, and then if they're of the same order, then you have to keep both. And if they're not of the same order, so if one is much larger than the other, then that indicates that maybe that that one should probably be more important than the other. Now, I will say the last step before I I I, I stop is this is again, 
used to form a hypothesis. So, so this is not like we're going to say definitively we're going to build bubble machines based on this scaling. It's more to say, okay, our hypothesis based on this ratio, we, it seems that surface tension is more important. Therefore, I'll go and test that hypothesis in some way. So don't think of this as like, this is the final answer. It's more of, oh, by comparing these values, I, it leads me to a hypothesis that says the surface tension should be more important. Or like we were talking about before, that when the, when the Weber number was so small, it leads to a hypothesis that says these droplets shouldn't break up naturally. And so it creates a hypothesis that you can then go and test as opposed to saying, this is the answer. So this shouldn't be the, the only way of explaining things in paper. Exactly. You would want to back this up and do and do something, which I, I you'll see how let's do here, that would say, okay, well, if this matters and this doesn't, then what, what would happen? That's right. Uh, no, I, I, uh, I, I totally agree. I, I think it's nice in these scaling relationships not to have any pre-factor when you compare. Uh, you know, of course, when you include them, it's nice to, um, it, it's important to kind of see, as Doug said, like how close they are to unity. But in these cases, as, I, as, as Doug also said, and you'll see later on, it's just for a, an initial hypothesis, right? You start with these simple relationships to see if, what's, the, what's the, the, the comparison, how do they compare these forces with each other, and can we then test it that indeed it's one over the other. So I think this is what we did in terms of um, uh, seeing whether gravity was important. Recall that, as I mentioned before, that this liquid was uh, extremely viscous. So as I said, that if you were to turn it upside down, uh, it would take minutes for it to flow. So in order to test the importance of gravity, what we did is we prepared the bubble right side up. So you can see here that the bubble, uh, as it extends beyond the surface, we rapidly rotate it and then we puncture it immediately, right? So we don't want to have any thickening of the bubble because indeed, like if you were to allow it to, um, to stay like this for a long time, some liquid would flow and would affect the thickness. So what we do is we immediately, uh, once we turn it upside down, we puncture the bubble. So here is a video that kind of shows what this would look like. So note here again, that gravity is pointing downwards. So if gravity was indeed driving this collapse, we wouldn't expect it to go upwards, we would expect to go downwards. So indeed, it's surface tension that um, uh, is driving this word towards the bubble base. And at the same time, if you notice carefully, you can still see this wrinkling pattern occurring at the edges, right? So gravity um, is, is definitely not driving the collapse. Then at the same time, you know, because it might still be in the opposite direction, it might be some sort, in some sort of way responsible to completely eliminate the importance of gravity in the bubble collapse and the ring instability. We performed the same exact experiment now turned on its side. So gravity is perpendicular here to any sort of um, uh, axis of symmetry. And again, we see the bubble collapses towards uh, its base. Again, the wrinkling uh, occurs. So we can definitely now say uh, from experimental observations that gravity is not important in this phenomenon, but it's, in, uh, but it's instead the bubble collapse is driven by surface tension. So in order to model the collapse, um, what we want to do here is, okay, we look at the bubble. Uh, as it collapses down, its height is decreasing as a function uh, of time. So we call the height Z, capital Z of T. And uh, as we said, gravity is not important. Surface tension is said drive the collapse. And it's perhaps uh, uh, resist and it's not perhaps, and it's resisted by viscosity. So if we were to look at the height here as a function of time, what I'm showing here is for different viscosities or N orientations. So this is in dimensional form. Now what I'm going to do is we compute the velocity at collapse, so how fast does the bubble uh, height uh, decrease with time? So as you can see here, we now scale in the inset the height with the radius and then time with the essentially the time it takes for the bubble to collapse based on the velocity. So we see here that all in all these cases, the, the data collapse on top of each other. Now this is not surprising because the way we have computed the, the velocity, I don't know if you can see my, uh, my mouse, probably not. Yes, we can. Oh, okay, perfect. So what we essentially do here is like right before the sudden acceleration is right in this region where you can kind of extract somewhat a linear um, uh, decrease. So what's the velocity in this range? So indeed, that's why the data collapse, it's not surprising, but can we now model this velocity 
based on the balance between surface tension and uh, viscosity. So what we're going to do here is we're going to um, uh, balance the capillary and viscous forces. So if we take uh, the entire area, before you saw gamma over R times dA, now dA is approximately equal to R squared, so therefore we get gamma times R. Again, no three factors here. And the viscous force is now equal to the uh, viscosity times the velocity times the thickness H naught at the top. So H naught refers to the thickness at the top. So if we were to now uh, balance this, we see that uh, mu V divided by gamma, I'm keeping this, everything here as you see in this box is dimensionless. So on the left is what we refer to the capillary number. So it's a ratio between viscous and capillary forces. And it scales as the, um, you might say the slenderness or the aspect ratio, so how thick the bubble is compared to the radius, uh, to the negative one. So it's uh, inversely related. So this kind of makes sense. Also based on my observations, I haven't shown them, but you'll see them later on, that the thinner the bubble is, the faster it's going to collapse. Um, so, in order to, sorry, is there a question? Yeah. So, conceptually, how are these forces, the viscous force and capillary force, are applied to the bubble, like directions or points of action. Mm -hmm. So I want to know how conceptually they're applied on the bubble. Ah, okay. So I think to think about this conceptually, the, the, the surface tension for just driving it inward. So in order to drive it inward, there has to be some sort of um, redistribution of the um, of the film, right? Because the film now is changing uh, essentially volume, and therefore its surface area is also changing. So based on this uh, collapse and uh, how the shape is changing, there is some sort of redistribution of the film as it's flowing, and uh, in that flow uh, is where we assume the, um, uh, the, the 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 viscous dissipation to be at. Okay, thank you. That makes sense. Okay, so in order to test this, we did these uh, experiments involving uh, interferometry. Uh, it's not a great video, hopefully you can see it on the top right, but what you can see here is if you were to shine this with a uh, light, uh, monochromatic light, in this case it's a blue light, what you can see is this, uh, these fringes that are propagating from the top. These are concentric circles. And uh, because it's becoming so thin, there is a, a, an interference. Uh, that you can, uh, uh, and what we did is we, we measured the intensity of the bubble and how it was changing with time. So based on this particular changing and evolution of uh, the intensity at the top, combined with a uh, exponential decay model that existed uh, in the literature, we were able to kind of estimate the thickness. Could you uh, briefly with your mouse, maybe highlight one of the rings and show it moving? Because it's, it's okay. sure. yeah. At least in the classroom. I think on the computer it's okay, but yeah, there you go. And especially here at the edges, if you notice that you can really see them propagate. It's not perfect, and this is the messiest part experimentally. What we dealt with was to measure the thickness. Uh, as you will see now in the results, um, there's clearly a lot of uh, uncertainty in this experimental technique. So. Um, what we plot here is this, uh, this ratio, essentially, that, that I mentioned, the capillary number, mu V over gamma, times H naught over R. So we had to measure H naught independently uh, in order to test how it uh, uh, affected the collapse speed. So indeed, we see that qualitatively, sure, the, the scaling relationship that we obtained was um, uh, qualitatively consistent with our experimental uh, results, but it was definitely not a very uh, high precision measurement. Um, so, uh, indeed, though, what, what, what it allows us to do is that, that even though there's a lot of... Um, um, sorry, can I, can I interrupt with a question for a second? Sure. Um, sorry, can you just clarify quickly one more time what is going on in that video at the top right and how you okay, use that? Yeah, sure. Uh, when, this, when this film is getting, uh, when the bubble gets very, very thin at the top, uh, what you'll start seeing, regardless, if you look, Carefully, you'll start seeing these fringes. Maybe if I go back, uh, perhaps you can see them here as well. Maybe you can see them right here at the bubble on the top. Uh, 
there are these uh, fringes that propagate. So because it becomes really thin, it interferes with uh, any sort of light source that's around there. And because it's getting thinner, these fringes that are of constant thickness, they start um, propagating towards the uh, base of the bubble. Uh, it becomes so, so thick that at some point, these fringes will start moving much, much slower. So they, they are moving at an uh, exponential decay. So in the beginning, they move very, very fast, and then they start slowing, lower, slowing and slowing down. So up to a point where the, thin, the thickness becomes so, so small that it will break uh, spontaneously on its own. What we do is we puncture it right before it wants to break on its own. And we use these interference fringes and their intensity to go back to the video. So if we go back here, uh, what we're using is uh, we're using the uh, we're tracking the intensity of the um, of, of the bubble, so the colors essentially, and we're tracking it with time. Uh, and what we're able to do is based on this law of exponential decay uh, of the thickness that it uh, thins down uh, exponentially. Uh, we are able to uh, compute kind of what the thickness is. is at the top. These interference fringes are really common in a lot of my microscopy techniques. Like if you're ever doing something with um, like a spherical indenter and you bring it close to a surface, you'll see these interference rings on the surface and you can use the kind of the spacing of those interference rings as a way to measure how far your indenter is away from the surface if it's not in contact. And so this, this utility of kind of these interference rings and measuring the, the spacing or the, or the distance between them to extract a distance uh, is is commonplace. It's hard to see in this video. You can kind of, I think for the students in the classroom, it's probably harder. I guess if you're on the computer, you can see a little bit better than on the projector here. But but yeah, the, 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 this is a, I think, a, it was certainly a technique that I was, I was familiar with. So I think it's something you'll see in other places. And I think the, the key here is also that the, the, the spacing, for instance, when you bring that indenter to a spherical surface, it has to be really, really close. So the thickness has to be really, really small to start observing the, um, uh, the interference pattern. So uh, uh, moving on, um, let's see. One more, one more uh, question, another question. Can sure. So for the inset of this, this graph, mm -hmm. can, can you go back to the slide? Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, one moment. There we go. So you non-dimensionalize the, the x and y axis for the smaller plot inside. So how do you know which form you should use when normalizing them? Because we don't have much parameter here, so it may be intuitive, but in some cases it's not very intuitive which form you should use for like the master graph. No, of course. And uh, I think a, a better way here to, to see this um, the best way to show this collapse of the data, um, if indeed our model is correct, and we take viscosity and surface tension as the driving forces, uh, if we now uh, replace V with uh, some sort of uh, characteristic length scale in the problem, in this case R, and by some sort of characteristic time scale in the problem, tau, what we'll find here is that we'll get that the characteristic time is going to be equal to um, nu H divided by gamma. So if instead in this plot over here, I were to plot V over R, and rather than V have nu H divided by gamma, uh, T divided by nu H over gamma, if the, plot, if the plots and the curves all collapse on top, of, on, top to, on top of each other, that meant that our model would be correct. Now the problem is that in this particular case, we, went, uh, we did measure the, the thickness, and this is something that we, we tried to do afterwards. The thickness was the, the, the thing that troubles us the most to measure experimentally. So what, what we did here instead is we, f we, we essentially uh, forced the collapse, right? So we knew kind of what this velocity uh, is going to be experimentally. We can measure it based on how fast it's coming down. And now it's, it's not surprising that they all collapse, right? Because it's based on the velocity that we computed experimentally, right? So if we just were to essentially you see this one over here in the inset, this is exactly kind of like the range of the velocities that will collapse, right? So indeed they collapse because we force them to collapse. But based on this velocity now that we measure, can we relate it to these particular values? And indeed if they follow our model, that means that our scaling is, is, is or our, 
I mean, that our model is, is fairly accurate in terms of describing the dynamics. I'll just jump in here to say, so, you know, just echoing what Alex just said, he's non-dimensionalizing the length by the characteristic length and the uh, time by the characteristic time in the problem. The next content we cover in this course is how to introduce characteristic length and time scales and how to find them. And so if that, if this part's not clear, I think that Alex's answer is spot on, but if this part's still not clear, this is what we, we do next. Okay, great. I have, I have one more question for the, maybe for the next prep. This, this one. If so, here are the x axis is h mod over r, so it should be inversely proportional. But why does golden line in the graph is like straight line? That's the inversely proportional line like this. Oh, uh, I think that's uh, I think if I'm, uh, why is it a straight line and not like a curve? Yeah, right, right. Oh, uh, that's because I'm plotting here in the uh, logarithmic scales. So if you if you look at the axis, it's in uh, in, in logarithms. So if you have any sort of uh, power law, so uh, something to the power of something, when you plot it in log scale, it's uh, it's going to become a straight line, and the slope of that line is going to determine the uh, the, the exponent. Yeah, I missed it. Thank you so much. So indeed, in this case, the, the, yeah, the exponent here is indeed negative one. Um, but the pre-factor to, uh, to go back to your question is not exactly one, it's actually 0 0.1. Mm -hmm. This technique Wait. really is like, if you're ever doing like scaling analysis, like we're doing here with this kind of squiggly line comparing orders of magnitude, and you arrive at a power law type form, which is often the case when you do some sort of scaling analysis, then you want to check that power law on a logarithmic scale. And as you can see here, in order to kind of confirm that your scaling is correct, you kind of need one to two decades of data to kind of say, yeah, it's not to the minus one and look, it spans one and a half orders of magnitude or two orders of magnitude in each direction. That's kind of what you're looking for to uh, to, to give you some confidence in your in your scaling. Yeah, in general, you'll see that most of my plots. I think the previous one was the only one that wasn't in logarithmic scales. I think every one, every other plot will be in uh, logarithmic uh, logarithmic scales. And especially when you and I've said that when you use these scaling laws, it's very it's it's always common to look for exponents. So. Does the velocity scale with what kind of, uh, how does it scale with the thickness? Is it thickness to the negative one, negative two, one or two? So uh, the, the logarithmic uh, scales really, really help to confirm that. So indeed what we see here is that the velocity um, uh, matches our predictions qualitatively. But as I said, there is a lot of uncertainty here based on how we measure the thickness. But it's, it's satisfactory enough for us to say that indeed this is driven by surface tension and resisted by viscosity. So now that we know the collapse, we can uh, go and look at the wrinkling. So this is the, the model that was suggested by the paper by uh, Da Silveira uh, in 2000. So they look purely at the wrinkling instability and indeed they say, as you recall, you might, they, that they said that gravity was driving and viscosity was resisting. So we know that gravity is not important. But then another parameter that enters the problem is this uh, R sub H. Now this is the radius of the pole. So if we look at this uh, relationship, if we set it equal to zero, if there is essentially no hole, that would mean that no wrinkling should occur, that M should be equal to zero. But based on our mechanism, if we consider the problem here, um, if we look at, uh, as I said initially, we had this excess pressure inside the bubble before it's, um, uh, before it's punctured. Now, once it's punctured, essentially allowing the hole, uh, puncturing the hole allows this pressure right there to escape. But what if we could do this uh, set up cleverly without having to puncture it? So what we did is we um, created this narrow channel below the bubble uh, and sealed it with a valve. So you inject air through this channel, you allow the bubble to rise up. Uh, and then once uh, the bubble is risen and it's sufficiently thin for it to start collapsing on its own, we open the, the valve and we uh, allow the bubble to collapse because the pressurized air will want to escape if it finds the uh, channel to do so towards atmospheric pressure. So this is what it kind of looks like. 
So indeed, we see the wrinkling instability again. If you look closely here at the center, you can see the channel. You can see a circle uh, right here that shows where the uh, channel is and where the air is escaping uh, through. And because now we observe this wrinkling, we see that the model is not, uh, it, 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 it definitely, uh, we can uh, uh, formulate a new model now uh, in order of explaining this wrinkling instability. So uh, if we look at what the elastic literature has done so far, because that's where it's mostly been uh, uh, addressed in terms of uh, wrinkling instability, you see this in, in elastic sheets. The main question that are asking about the wrinkling pattern is, what is the number of wrinkles that's referred to usually as N or N? Uh, we use N. And what is the radial extent of wrinkles? So far, how, how far uh, do they appear from the center? So if we look at the, the elastic case here, so this is when we have the thin sheet uh, that's floating on a, a curved uh, water interface, you can estimate the number of wrinkles uh, by considering the balance of compression that's occurring in the sheet as well as elastic intending. However, we also want to ask the question now, could inertia be important? Note here that uh, I forgot to add the animation that uh, we did not focus on uh, the radial extent of wrinkles. We only focused on the number of wrinkles. Uh, we did measure what, how far away they were uh, spaced, but the data was way too chaotic. And that understanding of uh, the model that you see later on was not, uh, uh, we, we, we needed to uh, expand our model much, much more to, to answer the second question. So we only focused on the first one. So we have compression and elastic bending, but uh, good inertia here would be important. As you saw before, the, the, the height itself, it suddenly uh, decelerates. So this deceleration could be reminiscent of the inertia being important. So let me uh, move on. So let's look at the role of inertia. So typically when we think of uh, elastic sheets or not sheets, particularly beams to be more precise, uh, we think about boiler buckling. If the compression force is uh, sufficiently large uh, to achieve the critical load, referred to as the boiler load, you get this buckled shape. So you see here, uh, the second image is the viscous thread that I showed before, but here you can also have an elastic sheet that bends in a similar way. But when you uh, compress this uh, structure very, very suddenly, uh, what you might have, what you might find, uh, and this has been shown experimentally uh, in solids and uh, modeled in a very nice way, that you can also get this dynamic buckling, right? So you don't get the single mode, but you get multiple, uh, you get much higher order modes, right? So you see the wavelength decreases by a lot. There has been a model, theoretical model, to kind of show for, for viscous threads what this should be important. So when the thickness itself is larger than uh, the Reynolds number, so here in parentheses is the Reynolds number that uh, compares inertial to viscous forces. So if it's larger than the, if the thickness is larger than the Reynolds number to the one fourth, that means that inertia is not important. But when it's smaller, so if it's sufficiently thin compared to how fast you're compressing this, uh, inertia could be important and you could have higher order modes. So if we look at the, the uh, equation here that describes um, the Euler buckling for a viscous sheet, you see here that we're going to have some sort of uh, stretch compression, sigma x, x, and that's resisted by viscous uh, bending. But if we now, here, okay, so yeah, indeed we have a uh, compression and viscous bending. But if we now were to consider the dynamic buckling term, you see uh, equation, excuse me, we see that we have the same terms, but we also have the addition of uh, inertia. Uh, so inertia here comes into play. And if we, an interesting uh, aside here is that if you were to look the elastic, um, uh, different, the, the differential equations in both cases for elastic sheets, they're very, very similar. The only difference here is that you get that um, uh, the viscosity mu is essentially taking the role of the uh, elastic modulus E. The difference here is that you get an extra uh, time derivative that, um, as you'll see later on, becomes important. So, if we were to then consider inertia, uh, let's, I'm going to show you a couple of pictures from an experimental point of view. So, what we have here is we have a um, 100,000 centistokes, so 100,000 times more viscous than water with a thickness of approximately 10 microns. So you see here uh, the wrinkling pattern and what it looks like as it collapses. Now, if we increase the viscosity to uh, 3 million times more viscous than water, we see that the wrinkling pattern uh, uh, gets affected a lot. And if we now were to decrease the thickness even more, we again observe a much more different uh, picture. So if we were to consider a dimensional analysis, uh, the Buckingham Pi theorem, I, I, I believe you 
you have been uh, introduced to this in, in class. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's consider, and we want to model the number of wrinkles. So we can consider the radius and surface tension. So we know surface tension is important as it drives the collapse. Uh, the radius itself uh, as a characteristic length scale, but based on our observations here, we see that viscosity is important, which is that the thickness is important. And then we're going to close it with uh, the density. Now, when I include density here, that means that I'm considering inertia, right? So I'm considering two length scales, the radius and the thickness. I'm considering now three physical forces that are at play, uh, surface tension, viscosity, uh, and inertia. So if you were to consider the uh, different uh, uh, physical dimensions in terms of mass, length, and time. You can find your three-dimensional uh, groups in this case, because if we were to do this uh, analytically, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, uh, six variables. Uh, we're going to choose, we have three physical dimensions, so we need three, uh, we're going to have three dimensional groups. I need to use R, gamma, and mu as your repeating variables. You can get the following dimensional groups. So the first one is just N. And it's a number, so it's dimensionless. So by itself, it's going to be the first dimensionless group. Now, if we consider the second one, it's going to be H. And from inspection, you can perhaps already see that the second group is going to be H over R. So how thin the bubble is compared to the uh, radius. And then finally, what we have here is we have uh, pi 3 is equal to rho gamma R divided by mu squared. This is often referred to as the Laplace number. And it's a ratio of inertial capillary forces divided by uh, uh, viscous forces. So how do they compare uh, towards each other? So you can then formulate the, uh, the problem that the number of wrinkles itself depends on uh, H over R and on the Laplace number. So if we were to take this, I'm going to plot here H over R. And on the x-axis, I'm going to plot um, actually not exactly the Laplace number. I'm going to plot the inverse and raised to the uh, power of one half. So this is what's referred to actually as the owners of a number. It's uh, just, um, how should I say this, handling this in a different way, just turning it upside down and looking at a uh, different way of how these forces uh, compare. So if you were to look for instance in the um, uh, graph here, as you move towards the right axis, you see that viscosity becomes increasingly more important since it's in the numerator. Uh, excuse me. But then when you go more and more towards the left hand side, uh, uh, inertia starts to become more and more important because it's in the denominator. So here are all, all, all of our experimental data by varying the viscosity and the thickness. So those were the two that we mostly varied and maybe a little bit the radius, but not by a lot. So viscosity and thickness were the one that you can see here really changed the order of magnitude, um, both on the X and the Y axis. And what I wanted to see here is, again, that if inertia, going back to the importance of inertia, uh, we said that inertia is going to be important if this thickness is less than uh, the Reynolds number. But recall here that we have a particular equation for our velocity from before that is going to scale with the thickness. And if we combine these, we see that we can get a, um, a scaling law or an inequality that says that inertia or dynamic buckling will occur when h over r is less than this uh, owners of a number to the negative two states. So if we were to plot this value, we see that indeed our, um, our data lies within this dynamic buckling regime, so where inertia does play a role. Whereas if you are above this line, where our data is clearly below it, but if you're above, then it's, it's the case where you should uh, neglect inertia. So if you're very, very thick, inertia is not important, but as you become thinner and thinner, uh, inertia could start to play a role. That's kind of what we argue. So since we can include inertia, this is nice, but from its own dimensional analysis can give us a nice uh, intuition uh, in terms of how we can move on. But in terms of getting accurate relationships, uh, it's, it, it can show us the, the, the important um, dimension of this group, but for getting the, uh, accurate uh, relationships or scaling laws, you have to go a step further and try to use um, uh, either governing equations or uh, uh, scaling laws from, uh, from, from balance of forces. And this is what we did. So if you consider a 1D model, so what we're going to take here is we're going to take that wrinkled animus and we're going to model it as a one-dimensional one viscous beam. So this is the equation that I showed before. Note here that the compression term has a sigma xx, but it's also resisted by 2 gamma. 
So there is an interesting point about surface tension here that while it does drive a collapse, any wrinkled, uh, any wrinkle that appears increases the surface area. And because surface tension wants to minimize the total energy, which depends on the surface area, it really resists any out of plane deformations. So it has kind of like a um, paradoxical or dual role that it initiates the collapse and the wrinkling, but it also wants to avoid any wrinkling. So that's why here uh, uh, you can see in the parentheses that it's minus two gamma, that it's actually uh, resisting any out of plane deformation. So what we're gonna do now, and I guess um, you'll probably learn this in next class, uh, we're going to uh, non-dimensionalize the uh, two variables in this problem, so time and space, by characteristic values that we intend to find. So in this case, I'm going to non-dimensionalize time with omega. So omega in this case is going to uh, represent how fast the wrinkles form. And as my characteristic length scale, in this case, it would be the wavelength. And if we consider the total radius, which is kind of the length of our beam, divided by the number of wrinkles, it's gonna give us the, the wavelength. So this is our new uh, length scale. And note here that uh, sigma xx, uh, and this goes back to, I think, the question that Garaman asked uh, about the prefactors and how we just simplify sometimes in scalings. If we look at the full form of the stress, it's equal to four times mu, the viscosity times the thickness h, and how the velocity u is changing with x. But we're just gonna simplify this with mu h uh, times v over r. So it's just uh, a uh, scaling um, equivalent that we're considering. And if we now use our uh, velocity that we computed for r, we see that this s, a sigma xx, the stress just simplifies as gamma. And therefore we see here that uh, what we argue is that it's larger than two gamma where we get the wrinkles. So the stress is large enough to uh, resist the smoothing effects of surface tension where wrinkling occurs, but smaller than gamma where we don't see any wrinkling. So the entire term here just simplifies to gamma. Now, if we take our uh, new time, the new, uh, new time and length scales are in dimensionless form. Um, and we were to now include them in the equation. So everything here um, is not dimensionless, but we are left with uh, three distinct terms. So we're left with an inertia term, a compression term, and a viscous bending term. So we have three uh, single uh, relations, three single uh, terms here that we can balance with each other. So if we now balance inertia with compression and compression with viscous bending, we have two equations and we also have two unknowns the wrinkle growth rate, omega, and the number of wrinkles, n. So we can therefore obtain a relationship for both of these equations. Now note here that the number of wrinkles that we find indeed depends on those two dimensionless parameters from dimensional analysis, right? That they are indeed h over r and rho gamma over mu squared. And what we see here is that they depend in this much more complex way in terms of uh, a power law again. So if we take our model here, and I'm gonna plot um, n, and instead of raising it here, you'll see why I'm raising it to the one eighth power. So the slope of this line is not one, but it's, I think, uh, a little larger than one, so that it is indeed equal to one over six. But what you can see here is that um, the data itself, it does not match perfectly with what we see. The only data that matches here, perhaps a little better than the other ones, are the ones that are here, the um, uh, purple stars. Now those are uh, experiments that my advisor had done in the past where um, they took molten glass and they were to, um, they were essentially uh, working it inside a furnace and allowing it, and they were blowing it so that it, 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 it adopted a shape that they, um, that was more closely resembling a, a, a cylinder. And as it was thin enough through the working process, they allowed the air to escape. So it adopted a wrinkle profile that looked more, much, much what you see here in the picture. So for this particular geometry, which is kind of a, um, a ring rather than a disc, which corresponds to our viscous bubble. So for the ring geometry, perhaps the 1D model does well, but for the 2D data, that 2D, for the disc geometries that correspond to the bubble, uh, as we see here, it's not ideal. Another thing here you can see is that uh, omega, uh, the wrinkle growth rate, if we were to reverse it, we're gonna get the time scale. So how, fa how fast do these wrinkles uh, develop? So again, if we were to take uh, characteristic values here, we find that this is about um, 0.1 milliseconds. 
But if we were to take a closer look over uh, how fast this uh, wrinkle develops, so this is on the bottom panel, we see that it's on the order of about perhaps 20 milliseconds, not 0.1. So even the length scale, the time scale uh, to the problem, it's uh, not, um, it's not uh, capturing what, what we observe experimentally. Uh, note that the computing this wrinkle growth rate is uh, experimentally is not uh, very accurate the way I'm showing it here, but it kind of gives you a, an order of magnitude, right? That you can see here that within, let's say, 0.04 seconds, so about 40 milliseconds, uh, you see that the wrinkles develop in that time. And this is much, much larger than what's uh, determined from this uh, scaling relationship from the 1D model. Hey, Alex, sorry, I think I missed it. Why are you plotting it to the 1 8th power, not the 1 6th? Yes, I uh, realized this later on. Uh, this is the one eighth is what we observe for two D that I'm about to go into. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, so this uh, this slope here is not exactly one; it's equal to one point something. So essentially, take one eighth and turn it into one sixth. I think that's. Um, I'm black now. I'll, I'll have to do it. Uh, that's okay. Yeah. Okay, but, but, it's, uh, okay. but it's, the, the slope here is not one; it's uh, one point something. And so the the blown glass example is closer to the one D case, and that's probably why it's falling on this one D line. Yeah, I, I mean you'll see here if, if you can also match it well enough with the two D case. Uh, the problem is that we don't have enough data for this particular ah. geometry. Even if you were to fit a horizontal line, I think you could, uh, in some sort of a way, explain that it would fit well with it. Uh, but I think you need more more data. Um, but if I if I had to guess in terms of the uh, if you were to consider a ring that you're pulling inward and it's buckling sinusoidally around its edges, uh, there was a paper uh, recently um, uh, th that showed this in the elastic case. Uh, I, I would expect the one D model to be more uh, appropriate for this particular geometry. Great, thank you. So this is what we saw with the one D model. But if we were to now consider a 2D model, um, what you see here is that the differential equation becomes a little more complex uh, because now rather than just considering the stress in one direction, so before it was just in the x direction, the actual direction of the beam, in this particular case, we have to consider both the radial stress, but also the azimuthal stress. So radial stress will be sigma r r, but then you also have sigma theta theta. Now when sigma theta theta turns negative, uh, you get compression and that's where we see that because it's really compressive in the azimuthal direction, it's that it's in that direction where we get the wrinkles. And indeed, if you see the pictures, um, uh, both in the elastic case, but also in the uh, viscous case, because they are in this azimuthal direction, uh, we might consider how the interplay that has been shown for uh, elastic sheet, the interplay between the radial and azimuthal stress to contribute to the wrinkling pattern. So we have to use this uh, more complex relationship. So I'm going to show it here. Um, now, this is uh, something that was done by uh, uh, the paper in the uh, elastic case. So what you do here is you assume a, uh, uh, you do a stability analysis. So you assume that the um, uh, center line, so zeta, which kind of uh, determines the displacement in the vertical direction of your sheet. So how does it vary? With both in both radial and uh, azimuthal directions. So, because we see that uh, it's a sinusoidal pattern in the azimuthal direction, you assume this um, exponential uh, omega t plus i complex i n times theta. So, this is uh, what's typically done in the in, uh, stability analysis to get a um, uh, solution. We could have done exactly the same thing in the 1D case and could have gotten a, a much more precise results. It's just nice to also show that you can get this from a scaling relationship. But if you do this now in the 2D case, we do have in the theta direction the sinusoidal form. But what you can see here is that it also depends on the radius, right? We have a flat portion of the sheet. So f is probably zero there. But then as you go into the wrinkled sheet, f does not become zero, right? So it starts to change. So if we were to include these terms into there, what we can do now is we can again obtain these pre-factors that determine the different shapes, so uh, the different portions. So we have our um, uh, inertia, compression, and um, and viscous bending. I think I might messed up the colors from before, so I apologize for that. And if we were to now take these uh, scaling relationships as well, something important to note here is what has been shown in the elastic literature is that 
the azimuthal stress does not um, contribute uh, to the number of wrinkles. Now, to me, this was very difficult to appreciate. So I just wanted to show you a little sketch. If we consider like, let's say the um, uh, azimuthal stress as a function of the uh, radius, we see that it's going to become negative in some sort of portion, which is where the instability, the wrinkling instability occurs. So you might consider that sigma theta theta is going to be important. But based on the interplay in the geometry, because it's confined in this particular circle, what happens is that the sheet itself cannot sustain this compression, and it essentially relieves this compression by the formation of wrinkles. So right after this, uh, what I guess referred to the post-buckling behavior is that the compression itself uh, in the azimuthal direction um, goes to zero, and you can essentially neglect it in the balance and only consider now the, the radial stretch. So if we were to now do this um, uh, balance now with, 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 uh, where we consider the radial stress, so in the, if you remember perhaps from before, we had an n squared in the red term. Now it's not there. Uh, and therefore, if we now do the balance, we see that uh, it gets uh, different. So the number of wrinkles doesn't scale. It's exactly the same um, uh, formula in here, but rather to the one six, it's to the one eight. And now omega itself, as we can see here, this was an interesting uh, surprise that it only depends on the balance of inertia and surface tension, and it really does not depend on viscosity. So this is the plot that I had before. Now, if we were to add this new line, we see that it uh, agrees better. So this does have a slope one. Uh, so it, it, it is the 2D case, and it agrees much better with our experimental results. Again, notice here it's in the log logarithmic scales. So we do have a model that we believe captures the, um, uh, the number of wrinkles um, much better from a 2D case than a 1D case. And now if we were to consider again the growth rate, in this case now we only have uh, rho h r squared over gamma, it doesn't depend on the scarcity. We you input these values and it's on the order of uh, 10 milliseconds, which is much, much closer to what we um, uh, observe experimentally. So. Uh, this is nice because now we do have a, um, a model that we believe much more in for the number of wrinkles uh, from a two-dimensional uh, balance uh, of, the, of compression, inertia, and viscous bending. So finally, I only have one last slide here that I want to um, uh, go over. Uh, Recall here this plot that I showed before that uh, showed the uh, inertia-free buckling and dynamic buckling regime. What I didn't mention here, and you probably maybe saw this in the previous plot, that these white triangles didn't appear in any of the wrinkled plots. And that was because uh, no wrinkling actually appeared. So you can perhaps see this in the video. This is for, this is 10,000, so it's equivalent viscosity of honey. And when you um, um, poke it and you rupture it at the top, the film collapses, but it doesn't obtain any wrinkles. So how can we explain that? So, no wrinkling will occur if the collapse time itself exceeds the uh, wrinkle growth rate. Um, or, excuse me, I, I wrote this the, uh, the other way around. If the wrinkle growth rate um, exceeds the collapse time, so it takes more time for the wrinkle to grow than for the film to collapse, then you cannot have any wrinkles. So if we add these particular equations uh, that we have for uh, the wrinkling growth rate and the collapse time, what we see here is that no wrinkles will occur when the thickness itself is smaller than, again, our owners of a number to the power of negative two. That means that inertia in those cases prohibits the formation of wrinkles. So if we were to add this now in our plot, indeed we see that uh, it, it closely matches to what we observed that um, uh, these 10,000 centistoke uh, silicon oil bubbles do not uh, obtain uh, any wrinkles uh, uh, to their collapse. So again, you can kind of use these nice um, uh, comparisons and inequalities between characteristic lengths and time scales to make predictions uh, from a dimensionless point of view. And just to jump in for really quickly, as, as Alex mentioned before, this, in a log walk plot, if you're not as familiar with working with these, the slope of that plot is dictated by the exponent. And the prefactor that we don't know will just shift that line along the plot here. So you know, you can see some of those white triangles in the dynamic buckling regime, but maybe there's a factor of two there that we don't know that would shift that line up or down accordingly. And so that's when you get to the point, going back to your initial question, of like when do you need to consider those numerical prefactors? You know, that this could be a point you say, well, okay, well, you know, we're neglecting something 
and that might shift that line, either, you know, to either include all of them or not. And, and that's kind of where you need to add more precision or you might want it, or you might be curious enough to think about adding more precision to it. But that just in terms of thinking about how the graphs work, that numerical prefactor is going to take the same slope line and move it up or down. Exactly. So exactly, for instance, because we're not including any prefactors, perhaps the, uh, the, the triangles could be all within the uh, Nordic League regime. Here we've assumed that the prefactor is uh, just unity, just one. Uh, and you can see this, that both lines start from the point one comma one. So, um, uh, but even if, uh, even with that, I think it's, uh, I, I was quite happy to see that our uh, results here were, uh, even though like some of them might be within more in the dynamic buckling regime and the ringling is expected in that one, but it still, I think, qualitatively captures kind of like our, uh, what we uh, observe uh, experimentally. So uh, this is what I uh, had prepared. So just as a, to conclude, we have provided a new explanation of wrinkling. So considering a, a two-dimensional disk uh, geometry, uh, we can uh, use the balance between inertia, compression, and viscous bending to determine the number of wrinkles. We have shown that its gravity is not important in the collapse, but it's rather driven by um, uh, and it's rather driven by by, by surface tension. So. Uh, Thank you uh, for uh, taking the time for, uh, to listening uh, to, to me. And, uh, I, uh, I hope you enjoyed the, 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 the topic and I'm free to answer any questions you, you have. Ah, awesome, thank you, Alex. Yeah, questions, anything we haven't covered, yeah. Um, going back to your 3D model, uh, I have a quick, can you hear me, Alex? Yes. Okay. Um, I have a quick question about the 2D model. Do you, uh, uh, I think it was in figure 3D, you're in figure 3D, you kind of have, uh, there are two uh, normal stress components along uh, that. Yeah, I, did, I didn't show it here in this particular case. I've shown it more generally in the in the radial one, but, but yeah, I, 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 I know which one you're talking about, yeah. Yeah, those two stress components. Hypothetically, then, is that making the assumption that along the surface of the bubble, you don't have a stress component along your thickness? Uh, yes, I forgot to mention this. The stress itself, it's not a force per um, square meter, uh, per square length. It's integrated over the thickness. Right. So also note here that we've assumed essentially that all of our thickness is constant. Now this is a big assumption or the thickness in the wrinkled region is constant. Now this is not what we know experimentally, like it's much, much thinner at the center than it is at the edges. Uh, but just for simplicity, we will assume that the thickness itself, and that's why I have this over bar here. Thank you for uh, pointing this out because I've completely forgotten to mention it, that it's integrated over, uh, over the thickness and it's essentially a force per unit width. Okay. That's why in the end that this entire term scales as surface tension because surface tension itself is the first unit length. So that they, they, they have to be uh, the same dimensions to keep, the, to, to keep it dimensionally homogeneous. So could you say that um, part of that assumption is suggesting that uh, the, the surface that's, uh, the immediate surface that's impacted by the wrinkling um, is not, doesn't see a significant impact from variations in thickness, even though. Well, that's kind of, I think that uh, we, we still are a little, uh, so I wanted to bring this up. So if, if, if you consider, for instance, this is R and this is kind of like the center and in this region is where we observe the wrinkling, but in this region over here, you know, where it goes positive, we don't really observe any wrinkling, right? So that's kind of what we assume the stress profile to look like. Now, in order to get this plot itself, uh, I've tried theoretically and I've uh, really struggled with it because of the variations in the thickness. I think the thickness make it, the variation in thickness makes it challenging to compute um, uh, theoretically how the stress is going to be. So we believe that the variation in thickness will be important in it, but I think it's also, even if you were to consider a constant thickness, uh, that based on the way this is collapsing, you might get a variation in the, in the radial stress that it, again is gonna look like that. All of the, for instance, all of the elastic literature deals with constant thickness and they still observe this wrinkling pattern. So 
it could be that even with a constant thickness, you might obtain this, but then uh, your, your, your equations would change a little bit, but uh, I, think, I think you'd still be able to get it. We, we recently had a, um, an expert from the elastic literature uh, wrinkling case, and they, he really was not uh, happy with, not happy. He really was very skeptical with what we have considered in terms of the thickness affecting it. We still believe that it's affected because of the way it's the velocity uh, of the collapse. So if you consider the radial, uh, how the velocity in this direction changes, I think that kind of determines uh, the stress distribution because the stress does depend on the velocity. But then the velocity itself also depends on the thickness. So we believe it's all kind of connected, but I think it's uh, very, very challenging uh, analytically to come up with something uh, that uh, can describe the precise uh, nature of this curve. I bet I can guess the expert that was unhappy. <laughs> I'll, leave, I'll leave that unnamed, but I bet I know. Um, yeah, other questions? Thank you. That was a good one. And I'll just jump in briefly to say that all of these types of, when you see a reduced order model, so 2D, 1D, um, and comparing it with you know, a 1D beam or a 2D surface, all of them are assuming, I think you asked this question, meaning that the stress is uniform through the thickness. And that's what Alex is referring to when he says kind of integrating through the thickness. It's assuming a constant stress through there. That's true uh, in all in, all, in these reduced order models, in which you're basically trying to simplify the problem from 3D, which you can't do anything analytical with uh, in many cases, to something that you perhaps can. And so you try to say, well, the variation is probably small, so we'll assume it's how much. Yeah. Other questions? I saw one in the chat. Um, oh, oops. Yeah. Would you? Would it be possible, Alex, for us to share the slides? I, I'm going to post the video as well. I don't know if that's okay. Of course. Uh, it's just a little large in size, so I'll send you a link to Google Drive if that's fine. Perfect. That'd be great. And then I'll I'll link to it um, so that the students can see it as well. Absolutely. Excellent. Okay. Is there some way to model the wrinkled surface as its own, you know, object? Maybe this gets a little bit into stuff that we haven't covered yet. But. So to model it as its own object? Like instead of instead of doing, you know, um, using this spherical or cylindrical coordinate system you're uh, uh, you're looking at um well, I think uh, perhaps maybe maybe this might show you like uh, in the one d case what we consider right is we're taking this region here that's wrinkled yeah, and we're essentially assuming okay, it's just an annulus. what if we were to like unwrap it and turn it into a beam yeah. So, that's kind of what we do in this case, right? We assume that uh, this particular region here, you can model as a 1D beam, right? Um, where you just have your stresses, essentially your stress here, your theta theta stress is going to become your sigma xx and you're complete, completely neglecting any stresses that are kind of perpendicular to here, like in the radial direction. So yeah. that's what we kind of did with uh, the 1D model. Uh, when we actually first submitted this for, uh, for, for, for review, it was, uh, it was the 1D model that we had. And one of the reviewers suggested that for us to look at the 2D uh, <clears throat> geometry, which we think was uh, much more accurate in terms of capturing what we were observing experimentally. But uh, even with a 1D case, I mean, you might not, I mean, if we look at the results here, yeah, okay, of course, the, the growth rate is not really uh, accurate, but it, it's, it's also not surprising considering kind of the assumptions that we've made in terms of turning this into a 1D case, right? So not everything is going to be captured by there. But even this was an initial approximation. I thought it did fairly well. In, but of course, as you get to much, much smaller, uh, so when we go more towards the uh, right of the x-axis, that means that your thickness becomes much, much smaller. And you really can start observing that um, uh, it, for thinner, thinner bubbles, this, this law for 1D would not be uh, very appropriate. Makes sense. Thanks. Any other questions? Um, I guess this isn't a super technical question, and I guess you can skip it if you want, but I guess 
what would you say the next step is? Like, where, where do you want this research to go in the future? With this particular project? <clears throat> or just this field in general? Uh, well, for this particular project, uh, I haven't shown this here, but what we did uh, in this particular actually picture that you see here, this is not really done through puncture. This is really through evacuating the air from uh, below it. Right? So we're not really puncturing this and allowing the air to escape from the, the hole, but we're really allowing it to escape through an opening at the bottom. So in this particular case, uh, so far, what I've shown you here, H, um, H here, yeah, we did measure it experimentally for the interferometry part and to show how it scales with the thickness and with the velocity. But because it's really uh, such a challenge and uh, really all these experiments were, were, were very uh, frustrating at times because everything happens really, really slow and it's really a messy system. Rather than having this measure experimentally each time, we just measured the velocity and estimated the thickness through our collapse, uh, through the velocity, right? So the next question one could ask is what happens when you independently vary thickness and velocity? So far they are related based on the fact that this is essentially spontaneously collapsing through capillarity. But what we did here is we, um, through this opening over here, which is connected to the um, to a valve, we, we, what I did is I varied the, 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 rather than letting it just opening the valve and, and opening for atmosphere for it to collapse spontaneously, I evacuated the air with a preset velocity so essentially, I controlled how fast this bubble was collapsing through allowing or sucking the air with a predetermined flow rate from a pump that you, you can control. So this is a really interesting system because now you can essentially control the wrinkling pattern. You can set what the number of wrinkles is going to be, and you can also kind of vary how far away they're spaced from, um, from the center. It becomes much more challenging because the, the entire problem changes because now you have an imposed force that is actually driving the collapse. Before it was just spontaneously happening on its own. So it really uh, independently allows us to separate the velocity and the thickness. And I think it becomes much, much closer to what has been con in terms of controlling these experiments and relating them with what has been shown in the elastic literature. Thank you. All right. Well, if there's no other questions, then we can thank Alex again. I really appreciate you coming. This was fantastic. And, and hopefully it, it uh, both demonstrates the utility of what we're learning, but also it's just kind of inspiring to see um, how you can kind of connect creating a hypothesis, testing a hypothesis, and, and developing uh, mathematical models. And so I, I really appreciate it. This is fantastic work. Um, uh, and I appreciate you taking the time to, to walk walk our class through it. So thank you, Alex. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, leave, I guess, then. Thank you again. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to, uh, we have like 20 minutes left, but I'm going to just call it for today. This was, this was all I wanted us to cover. We'll come back uh, next Tuesday. And uh, some of the stuff that was discussed here in terms of characteristic length scales and time scales and in terms of non-dimensionalizing these, these equations, which will tie back into these dimensionless groups, these pi groups, which were used in kind of laying out that phase map. We're going to talk about that in detail next week. So that's the next topic that uh, we're going to focus on. So thank you, everyone, for coming. Thanks for coming with good questions. And uh, I'll see you all next week. <laughs>